Good evening, everybody. Wonderful to have you here. Um, if you'd like to take a seat. Um, my name's Alex Halliday. I'm director of the Earth Institute at Columbia University. I've been here for a couple of years, and it's great. I love New York. And, the, um, and uh, right now, Britain seems pretty rough, so uh, <laughs> glad to be here. So um, I just wanted to say uh, that since I arrived, um, there are two things that I really wanted to focus on. Uh, one was climate and energy uh, in coming to Columbia and building up the Earth Institute. And the second was communication and finding ways to actually express our concerns and our feelings and our thoughts in different ways within uh, society. And it struck me that not enough was going on in that space. So uh, we f one of the first people I met when I came here was Carol Becker, uh, Dean of the Arts, who's um, become a, a, a sort of collaborator, friend, colleague, supporter in what we're jointly trying to do in terms of trying to build up the discussion around climate change in new ways. Um, so today's events and tonight's uh, panel event is really, really important from the point of view of epitomizing what we're trying to do in terms of moving the dial on climate communication. And to some extent, you know, uh, universities are not meant to be um, advocacy organizations. Where they should be sort of seen as being um, places where you get uh, distinguished and carefully thought through ideas and all the rest of it where we basically, uh, people trust academics above, above all. But the fact of the matter is that if you don't have 99% of the population actually believing in climate change right now or taking it seriously, then you've got a massive problem. And we have got a problem as academics and as, particularly as scientists, learning how to communicate better and getting on people's wavelengths. So climate change is massive. It's far worse. There's an interesting talk uh, by Wally Broker, who passed away last year, is one of our greatest climate scientists at Columbia. And he gave a talk in 2000, about 2014. And he sort of, one of the things he said was, you know, the problem really isn't the climate skeptics. The problem is actually is the climate scientists and the people who are on board with climate and the public who actually believe in climate change don't realize how really bad it's going to get. It's going to get really, really bad. And so we've got to think about how we're going to prepare society for this in a way that hasn't really been uh, done effectively so far. So one of the things we're doing at Columbia is, um, apart from having these great events and enjoying uh, talking with each other and exchanging ideas and building a big focus on climate communication, uh, is looking at the idea of building a climate school. And this has just uh, um, taken off. So in September, Lee Bollinger, President Bollinger, made an announcement to the university um, saying he wanted to see what else we could do. And he's put me in charge of a committee, which was supposed to be six people and ended up as 25 from across the university, as these things do. And what was amazing was there are people from everywhere in this university who said they really wanted to know more about what was going on. And they said there's amazing stuff going on in their own departments. History, pretty much every faculty member interested in the issue of climate change. There are people in social sciences, particularly in, uh, and in, sorry, in social work, really concerned about psychology of people, young people in particular, affected by climate change. And people working in uh, all kinds of interesting areas and diseases who are worried about how climate change is going to affect things. So the breadth of interest across Columbia is massive. Uh, the breadth of skills is amazing as well. We're very, very strong in the subject area. And we think that actually we should, rather than just regard it as just an opportunity, we should see this as a responsibility being so strong in the subject that we should aim to do, aim to be even higher and, and um, or aim higher in terms of our attempts to really impact uh, what's going on in research and education in this area. So it's very exciting. I've never designed a school before in my life, but it's, um, and you don't get to it very often, but uh, we really are having a fantastic time thinking about what it is that we need to do and do differently. And a key part will be transdisciplinary working with teams from across the humanities, social sciences, medicine, engineering, and, and the hard sciences as well. So um, it's very exciting. Look forward, watch this space. Uh, you'll be hearing more. We're, we're designing at an incredible pace. So Carol was on this committee that we had, which was, we basically had two months, and we designed the thing. We didn't design it. We basically came up with a recommendation with a 100-page report, went to the trustees, and the rest of it. We're now designing the thing in two months. We're going really fast, and we're going as fast as we can because we want to start you know, this summer, basically, and get going because we haven't got long to hang around on this. So, so we want to basically focus on the next 10 years and what we can do to make a difference 
and we really want to get people involved in this in a, a very big way. Anyway, I'm talking too long. I'm supposed to be introducing this massive event tonight. And uh, what I really wanted to say was one of the key things that's been important in the climate communication side of Columbia University is the work of uh, Kate Marvel and her team in particular. Woo! Oh, there we go. So, uh, <laughs> so I want to thank Kate Marvel in particular for uh, her amazing work, uh, but also for organizing this event along with Adam Sabell, who's here, and uh, me and Chris, who I think is not able to make it, and uh, Tracy Ellis as well, who's not going to make, uh, make it. But, uh, oh no, I think she's here. So um, the idea is to talk um, uh, extensively tonight. I'm going to invite Kate to come in and introduce the panel to you that she's got. Just to let you know, I'm going to have to walk out partway through because I've got to get on a plane to uh, the other side of the pond. So um, don't think I'm offended or uh, annoyed with what's being said if I walk out partway through. It's nothing to do with that. So uh, please give a big, broad, warm round of applause to Kate Marvel. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, mic's working. Everybody can hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so I am Kate Marvel. I am a scientist here at Columbia. And I am very delighted that nobody on this panel is a scientist, because I think it's really important for scientists to have conversations with people who have other areas of knowledge. That's something that's really, really important to me. So I want to introduce you to these amazing people. Um, so first, um, I'd like to introduce you to Kendra Pierre-Lewis, who is a reporter uh, at the New York Times on the Climate Desk. Um, our next panelist is Catherine Wilkinson, who is the current vice president of the amazing Project Drawdown. And finally, uh, the climate justice essayist and current writer in residence at the Earth Institute, Mary Hegler. So first of all, thank you guys so much for being here tonight. Um, I want to start with a very naive question um, from a scientist's perspective. We have written so many reports. We have so many graphs. We have a lot of equations. We have known that anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions could warm the planet since 1896. Why hasn't anything changed yet? <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, Kendra. Um, well, I guess there's like two reasons. One is just like practically speaking, um, until like the I think it's fair to say that until like the late 1960s and 1970s, the idea that anthropogenic climate change was more than a theory was like not as true. Um, this, I would say that in the 70s, I, Bill McKibben wrote, um, God, what's that book? He wrote his book about. I cannot for life me remember the name of the book. The End of Nature, thank you, in like 1988, 1989, and I would say that around that era, the science is pretty solid. So there's that element, which is like, it takes a while, as you know, to kind of go from theory to fact, if you will. Um, and then the other side of it, which is, um, you know, some people in the audience have chronicled pretty well, which is a kind of consistent disinformation campaign. And also the nature of journalism, science journalism has changed a lot over the past 20 years because... In the beginning, um, a lot of science journalism was predicated on both sides. So one side says this, one side says that. And certain actors kind of use that to sort of deliberately sow misinformation. And we were often for a while giving weight to the side that said, oh, climate change isn't happening, that the evidence didn't, didn't sort of, did, that weight should not have gone as heavily to that side. So there's that element of like the public not knowing. But even with that, like there's still, you know, climate emissions went up last year globally. So there's still this element of like why people are not choosing to act. And I think that is a social science or a social political question that I can't answer. Yeah. Um, I would add it depends on what we mean by we when we say we knew. Um, because one, I don't think everyone knew it. And two, I don't think everyone was participating 
in the creation of all of these emissions. In fact, I know not that they weren't. And I think it's because it's not just about being right. Um, it's about um, more than just that. It's about more than just science, it's about justice. Because I think if you look at the systems that brought us here, plenty of people knew that you know slavery and colonialism was wrong from the very start. And that's what brought us to this point. Um, it's just that those p people weren't listened to or cared about. I will quote um, <clears throat> some uh, uh, one of the youth leaders who was on a panel that was moderated by Al Gore during Climate Week, and she said, I'm really sorry to tell you, but your graphs were incredibly boring. <laughs> <laughs> Which one was that? <laughs> Jamie. Uh, it might have been Jamie. Yeah. I think maybe it was Jamie Margolin. And um, but yeah, because <laughs> graphs are not enough. Yeah. Um, because you have to have a story around it. But I think even more than that, I would say because the climate crisis is a leadership crisis, and we have had, I think, until relatively recently, pretty shallow analysis about the root causes of the problem, at least from a sort of widespread perspective, the root causes of the problem and like what needs to shift to actually address the scale and the scope of it at the speed that's required. Um, and so, you know, I think as long as you are expecting the same leadership that got us into this mess to get us out of it, you're not going to see the transformation that's required. Yeah, exactly. So I, from my perspective, I feel like things are changing now. I feel like we've seen Fridays for the Future, Greta Thunberg. I feel like we're seeing a mass youth activism movement. We're seeing presidential candidates, at least in one party, being asked about climate change plans. Mm -hmm. um, and so from where I'm sitting, it looks like we're experiencing a change right now. Mm -hmm. So from your perspective, is that true? And, and why do you think that might be? Okay, fine, I'll do it. Um, yes, I agree that there is definitely a change. And I would also say that there is a change on the other side, too, that is like, very, very frightening. Um, there's a change on the, the global right um, to go toward more nativistic, fascistic um, responses to this crisis, which is really, really terrifying. Um, and I think that that's because climate change has jumped out of the textbooks and into the headlines in a way that you really just can't ignore. And even beyond the headlines, it's jumped outside of your window um, in a way that just you can't look away anymore. Um, I also just, I think it's not even just the youth movement on the other side. I, I, I mean, I wasn't involved in climate 10 years ago. Um, I sort of thought it was something that was really, really far away. And then the next thing I know, like, it ain't. Um, so yeah, I, I think that there is a really big change and there's a lot of momentum to capitalize on. And there's a chance right now to make sure that the ship doesn't go very far in the wrong direction direction in terms of how we treat each other, because that I think is really what it comes down to. I only want to speak in a US context with what I'm about to say. I don't want to speak in a global context. But I think it's a combination of Hurricane Harvey, I think really freaked people out, mm -hmm. um, followed by the 1.5 degree C report. Um, as a journalist, I can say that like the way the public responded after 1.5, um, do you guys know what I'm talking about when I say, yeah, okay, the IPCC released a report which was sort of like what happens if we warm to 1.5 degrees C and that we're going there way faster than they thought we were. Um, even it, within the newsroom, I felt like there was a sea change after that. And often with the way the public sort of reached out to us and were interacting with us, there was a change after that. I think there's like, you know, Harvey kind of was domestically speaking was kind of this trigger. Like, I think it really freaked people out. And then the speed of hurricanes, that whole year, the speed of hurricanes that happened and the ones that followed since and the attention that we're spending to California wildfires. I don't feel like the California wildfires were a national problem before. Mm -hmm. They were a local problem and now they're, they've they reached national prominence, which they yeah. should, they're, they're very large. Um, and it's kind of the same this year with what's been happening in Australia. People are looking and they're seeing things and it's very uncomfortable and it's very disconcerting. And I think that's, that's the fact that you can see climate change now is really shifting people's perspectives. Yeah. I totally agree um, with all of those things. And I, I think, um, yeah, this sort of sense of pressure building, right? Physically, socially, 
Mm-hmm. Um, I think also like genuine movement building takes time. Um, you know, you, you really think about transformative moments of social change, culture change comes first and culture change is diffuse and hard and slow. And I think that snowball has finally built. Um, and also the work of just going like one to one, like Mm -hmm. we need you in this, this is happening. Um, like that work I think is finally adding up at a scale that, that makes a difference. Um, And I also think that it is easier to grapple with the magnitude of the challenge when the solutions have also kind of reached a press. They're they're not all there, certainly not in some of the sort of hardest to decarbonize industrial sectors, et cetera. But like a lot of the toolbox is full now. And so I think it is... um, In some ways, it's like you can look headlong at a problem when you have some sense of like what resources will we marshal, what tools will we we marshal to handle it. So given that we do seem to be in this new reality, I'm really curious how we can start to tell stories that reflect this new reality. Because I feel like for so long, as, as Kendra kind of mentioned, the only story you are allowed to tell about climate change is climate change. Is it real or is it not? Mm-hmm. And like, that's a boring story because it's real. Um, and I don't understand <laughs> why we need to tell this story over and, there and were over the and over. Um, but not only is that story kind of like a wrong and boring and horrible story, But it's also really ill-equipped to deal with this new reality where Mm -hmm. there are people who are terrified they're going to have no future. And then on the other side, there are people who are ready to use this to push forward really harmful, toxic, horrible policies. And so how do we even begin to think about adapting the stories we tell for this new reality? I mean, I don't know. I've been a real fan of the like humans are terrible, horrible, no good, very bad, greedy, lazy, incompetent. Like that's the party I want to go to. No, I'm (laughs) kidding. (laughs) Is that a children's book? (laughs) I mean, that like was the subtext of so much of climate discourse, right? Which is like, wow, you guys know how to have fun. Mm. Um, No, I I mean, to me, I think the stories of agency are really exciting. The stories of people like showing up and stepping into the work and like using their superpowers, whatever they may be, right? Whether you're a teacher, a farmer, an organizer, um, an elected official, a designer, a musician, right? Like the, the stories of, of, of people taking ownership of this moment um, and of the transformation that needs to take place. And I think what's also really exciting about those stories is that you can start to see yourself Mm -hmm. in them, right? My feeling right now is that um, there are so many people just on the sidelines of engagement. Um, And there's a sense of like, but I'm not quite sure how to, how to join, right? Yeah. Um, or what it might look like, you know, my best friend from college lives in Spartanburg, South Carolina, and she's just like, what am I supposed to do in Spartanburg? You know, and she's like, all right, I'm going to come in through the, through the lane of like food waste. And, you know, and, and then these, the snowballing effect of agency and participation. I, I, to me, those stories we need to hear a lot more of. And they complicate the notion of like, who is a climate leader, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And I think we desperately need that as well. Yeah, I think it's really important to tell stories that people can see themselves in. I completely agree with you that way. Um, And I think that um, that's why I always write in first person um, and why to me it's really important to talk about what it feels like to be alive right now because I think it it is terrifying. It's it. It brings about all sorts of emotions um, for people, and therefore, like they need to feel like that needs to be validated before they can feel like they can that they can take action. Um, the other sort of story that I think is really uh, motivating to people is are those that undress the villain. 
um, and sort of make it clear the emperor has no clothes. And that can be anywhere from like politicians that are subsidizing fossil fuel companies to fossil fuel companies themselves to the trillion trees bullshit, like any of that <laughs> sort of thing. Trees are great. Trees are great. But like maybe don't cut them down. Then you won't need to replant them. But um, <laughs> so, yeah, I think stories that like sort of undress and like expose the lies that we have been told um, make it clearer that like these are small people with small ideas. We're burning a big planet. Um, I should say that I kind of come from the other side as a full-time journalist. And also my primary is like science journalist. So um, I'm, a, I'm a climate journalist, but a lot of my work is about climate science and sort of getting people to understand what's happening on this planet from a scientific perspective. So I'm like Mary, I almost never use the word I in any of my stories. And oftentimes um, if I use the word I, I feel like I failed um, because I'm not the story, um, uh, just because of the nature of the work that I do. And, um, and my goal isn't to motivate people or to, um, there's no call of action to my work. Um, that tends to fall on the opinion side of the shop. Um, and so I'm operating within kind of um, structural constraints of my profession. And so I just want to like make that like clear and just like be honest about that. The thing that I try to do, um, a coworker of mine said that she likes my stories because it's uh, climate change stories can very often, climate science stories can very often take this narrative arc, which is it got hot and then something bad happened. <laughs> um, so like, I don't know, I don't ever really, like it got hot. So a lot of people died. <laughs> As opposed to the genre of it got hot and something sexy happened. <laughs> I mean, Nelly, <laughs> right? Nelly. Oh Different my God, genre. that's dark. <laughs> um, and so what I try to do, uh, what I try to do, my story. okay, we're all going to go now. <laughs> Kate, Kate told us we could behave badly. <laughs> yeah, she encouraged it. This is all my fault. I'm sorry. Um, what I try to do in my series, I guess, are three things. One is to kind of create a sense of um, awe or wonder um, and um, of like the planet, because I think the earth is pretty cool. Um, the other is I try and communicate um, the harm that is happening, but I try not to just be like, it got hot, so a lot of people died. Um, although I have done that story, and sometimes that story is necessary because sometimes it does get hot and a lot of people die. Um, but also, so like, I don't know, I'm going to try and give an example. So I did a story. This is kind of the one that I was the most proud of because I walked up to my editor and I was like, hey, I want to do a story about kelp. And um, and uh, I don't know, how many of you guys are from the West Coast? How many of you are from California? How many of you are from Northern California? So the kelp forest in 2013, 2014 in Northern California got decimated by an ocean heat wave, and it ended up being what's known in scientific terms as a trophic cascade, basically a domino effect because they lost their kelp forest. There were, um, like a whole bunch of uh, kind of critical commercial fisheries kind of went out of business. Um, and so that was a story that I told, and I told it through this story. You know, I found a guy who's... Um, who was running his father's dive shop because one of the fisheries that went out of business was this recreational um, abalone fishery. Um, they could, you can't fish for abalone anymore in, in Northern California. And you know he had inherited it from his dad and there's a picture of him with his dad on the wall and his dad had died. So it's not just a question of like he lost his livelihood, but it's really um, of him potentially losing his livelihood. But really it was imperiling this thing that he had inherited from his father. It was bigger than him. So I try and tell those stories where it's like, like, why should you care about, you know, kelp or urchins in Northern California if you don't eat urchins and you've never been to Northern California? I try and get it like, no, but you know somebody who inherited a business from his father and wants his business and you want to hold on to it. So those are the stories that I try to tell. Yeah. And then the other side, the the one thing, I don't know if it's a good thing, but climate change is happening. And so there are like now more climate adaptation stories. So I went to Duluth this year, last year. I don't know time anymore. Last year in March, which I don't recommend. Um, it was still really <laughs> cold. Um, and Duluth is really, you know, just because of where they are geographically, they're not gonna get as hot as other parts of the world. They're going to have water. Mm -hmm. They're really just geographically well-suited to adapt to climate change. And so the city is sort of really sitting down and reconciling what does that mean and should they be a climate refuge cities? Um, they're not the only ones thinking this way. Buffalo has mentioned this. There are a few cities that are literally sitting down and thinking about it. And then there are others that just know that they're geographically well-placed. 
Um, that said, it was still like negative 30 that winter or something. So like, I'm not moving to Duluth anytime soon. Uh, <laughs> I have a lot of Caribbean blood in me. Uh, <laughs> um, so I also try and tell that side of the story, which is, I guess, kind of getting at what Mary is talking about, which is sort of getting people to envision what a world of climate change means. And that means kind of both sides. Yeah. I would also just add that you do write a lot of stories that I see myself in. And I don't think the first person is the only way to do that. I definitely saw myself in the kelp story and thought you did a really great job. And I, I really love uh, and see this in your work, the point about awe and wonder. And that was something that I like kept in my mind every day working on Drawdown was like, am I capturing wonder and curiosity here? Um, and like, if I'm an 18 year old first year college student and I encounter this book, is this going to capture my imagination in a way that I want to dig deeper? And I think part of that and, and some of the kind of feedback that we got about the book was that it, in, you know, it's a collection of a hundred pieces about climate solutions, but that net net, it starts to tell a different story about humans as not just terrible, horrible, no good, very bad, but as creative and compassionate and committed and sometimes gutsy and brilliant. And <clears throat> I think like, that's the story we want to actually participate in, right? Um, not the maybe I'll be less bad sort of story. Um, and, and I, th I think, yeah, I think that piece of that sort of sparkly wonder piece is, it's really important. And like this planet is magnificent. And I mean, that's what I love about some of your writing, Kate, especially that I think you just bring that to life in a way that is, you know, gripping and tear jerking and beautiful. I think we're Great. all Team Earth here. <laughs> <laughs> we're all Team Earth, and we're all Kendra, Kendra and Kate yeah. fangirls. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, sorry, I don't. Uh, I'm partially joking, but I'm also not joking because, like, we're there's a lot of conversation right now about like, oh, we'll just move to Mars, and both um, Shannon Sterone, who's like a science writer that I'm, um, you know, I'm friendly with on, on Twitter, and Kate Kitty Mac, is that who's on Twitter? Yes. Yeah, they're both pretty adamant about the fact that, like, you know, like Mars doesn't have. A magnetosphere, like it's highly radioactive. That, Mars like, sucks. <laughs> yeah, it also doesn't have like not Mars really sucks. like there's like lots of issues with like moving into space right now. And um, <laughs> shock. <laughs> um, but there really is this like I think it was Jeff Bezos who, in an interview, said something to the effect of like, if we want a sustainable Earth, we have to m move into space because space will be like our mining operation in the future. And I just, I mean. Apart from the fact that it's literally the plot of The Expanse, which, you know, he's, he helped save. So, um, yay, because I love that show. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just think there's something really disheartening about this narrative that we can't make it work here. And also that we can somehow terraform out of space more easily than we can make it work here. Right. Yeah. And back to climate crisis as leadership crisis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my PhD is actually in astrophysics, and I can confirm that all the other planets suck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think Shannon's argument, she has this tweet that I have to dig out, and it's something like, space is trying to kill you. It really is. Yeah, yeah. don't move there. I mean, Jeff Bezos can move there if he wants. Um, <laughs> but, um, so you were all being wonderful and positive and supportive. And this is New York City. Um, we need to complain about some stuff. Um, so I want to invite you to complain, but I want to invite you to complain about something really specific, which is this concept of zombie narratives, which are narratives that are so persistent, that are so hard to kill, but are really poisonous or really unhelpful or really just wrong. So do you think that there are narratives like that that are currently poisoning the climate discourse? Yes. <laughs> Go on, could, girl. Could you elaborate? <laughs> um, I have a, a narrative that um, is really just, it, it's two narratives, but it's like two sides of the exact same narrative, um, which is, I've talked about it to y'all a little bit earlier today. One is, on one side is that we must be hopeful. We got this in the bag. It's going to be fine. Um, because I think that that immobilizes people. And then on the other side is the narrative that we're all screwed and we should just give up right now. 
because that also immobilizes people in a totally different way. And I think, <laughs> Marie said this, but I think that the people who subscribe to either one of those, is prob they're probably really annoying to watch movies with because they're like, I know what's going to happen. And you don't because this is not a movie. This is real life, and we all have choices to make here, and we all have agencies. Like, we're in the room where we're writing it. Um, and both of them sort of shirk um, responsibility. Um, both of them sort of um, feel very privileged to me. Um, and so, yeah, I hate, I hate both of those very, very much. Um, another <laughs> narrative I hate is that... Um, this has nothing to do with justice or this has nothing to do with, you know, like that social justice is somehow some annoying little tack on. And we should, yeah, and we shouldn't conflate the two of them because if you're looking at the whole system, I feel like you'd have to have, you'd have to willfully ignore it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I want to pick up on that one because that one drives me bananas as well. Like mm -hmm. the idea that somehow equity is secondary to survival when it's like, no, so no, nice to have. equity is survival. Yeah. And also if you, again, have any depth to the analysis of what is causing the climate crisis, it is the same system that is causing mass inequality, right? To, to me, sometimes I'm just like, eh, the, the planet's just giving us feedback um, about the same broken system that we're getting all other kinds of feedback about. So yeah. I agree. That one drives me bonkers. Um, I hate that it's become really like, you know, cool to be like the polar bear narratives aren't cutting it. Like that's the problem with climate communication. I'm like, okay, no, definitely polar bear narratives should not be the only narrative, but also a planet that doesn't work for polar bears probably doesn't work for us. So like, why do we now have to like shit on polar bears after acting like we cared We've about been polar bears? shitting on polar bears. You know, I'm like this, yeah. it just all seems pretty unfair no, to the me. polar bears have suffered enough. I They've agree. suffered yeah. enough. I and then have I actually seen a polar bear in the wild and it was terrifying. <laughs> Did you hug it? <laughs> no, um, I fled like, well, first I ran towards it because I'm a moron. <laughs> <laughs> New narrative. <laughs> Wait, uh, <laughs> we're going to get back to you, Catherine, but where were you? I was in the North Slope of Alaska, and if you're wondering why, it was not I, I was not reporting. I was visiting a friend who was a kindergarten teacher. Um, <laughs> I, I, go oh, on. Um, for we'll come back to you, Catherine, I no, promise. No, no, no. I just gotta... she, she was, sorry, this is like a wild aside. I will tell you. Uh, so the ice, sea ice is a thing. It freezes. And in this, she was in an Inupak village and they hunt whale every year. And the ice had frozen, the ice had closed. So they weren't hunting at the moment, but they'd hunted earlier in the week and they leave like the intestines and the carcasses out. I mean, there's not a lot to do in Bush, Alaska. So you basically go outside and you hang out. And so we were outside on the ice hanging out. And the way the sea ice kind of freezes um, is it forms almost like a sand dune, but it's an ice dune. And um, my friend's from, I should not out her, she's from South Carolina. Uh, and she started making this noise. And it was like, eh, eh. And I'm like, what is happening here? And coming over the ridge was a polar bear. You see the nose first because the nose is very black. And, uh, and me and her boyfriend at the time were like, awesome. And we ran towards it. And she was like, I, she had done a lot of work out in Montana and grizzly country. And she was like, nah, <laughs> like immediately ran away from the polar bear. And we got really close, like too close. And then we we're like, this is not good decision making. Um, <laughs> so we ended up, uh, we had a snowmobile and a four wheeler and I can drive neither. And so I ended up hopping on the back of the four wheeler and we took off and it was great. I mean, but they run fast. They do like 30 miles on the ice. It's like scary. Sorry. This is a complete aside. But, um, uh, fast forward a year, I was working in a new job and I had sent, you were supposed to send your photo around the office and I sent my polar bear photo instead because I was like, you don't care. It does not matter what I look like. What matters is I saw a polar bear. Um, <laughs> and a coworker wrote back and he was like, uh, he was a, a trekking guide in his off season and he had done a trek in the Canadian Arctic the year before. And, um, it ended up becoming a vice and inside climate news documentary because when he was doing this trek, um, a one of his, I don't know, guests, guides, I don't know what you call it, um, a polar bear had attacked him through his tent and he had to get medevaced out. And it was a whole thing where the, you should look it up. Um, the um, the, the w weather was closing and so the Canadian government couldn't actually fly the rest of them out. So they all had to hike out themselves the entire time being stalked by a polar bear. And it turns out that um, because of climate change, a polar bear had shifted their migration route slightly and they had accidentally... Uh, 
set up tent in what's essentially like the polar bear highway in the Canadian Arctic, which is, I guess, getting back to the topic at hand. But anyway, we both kind of agreed that um, polar bears are awesome because if you've ever had the opportunity to see one, they kind of create a respect and awe for nature that like, um, I'm, I'm very happy to never see another one. Um, again, <laughs> like to be clear, they are terrifying animals. Um, but it was really cool. And so I, I feel like we've established in this panel things that want to kill you space, polar bears, climate change. But polar bears are good of all of those things. Right. That's yeah. a good way. I feel polar bears would be the way I would want to go of those three options. <laughs> the, the guy um, survived. And so the documentary actually has him flying back out to the bush to talk about surviving being. And the polar bear bit him. It went through like a layer of electric fencing and it bit him through the tent wow. in the head. Like it's a whole thing. I'm so glad I asked. Um, <laughs> sorry. But, yeah. Go ahead. Kevin. Okay. This is the really the one that I really don't like. Um We, like, immerse people in the horror of the problem, and then we whiplash them into the solutions without ever taking a moment to, like, breathe Mm -hmm. and acknowledge that, like, well, that's super hard, right? Um, And maybe you're not just feeling fear or hope. You're probably feeling grief, apathy, Mm-hmm. distress, anger, grief, anger. Um, clearly grief. I repeat a lot cause that's my numero uno climate emotion. Um, right. And like th- the insistence of like, it's really bad here. Are the answers is like, yeah. what? Like that just feels, mm-hmm. it feels not human, right? It feels really mechanical, Um, and I think that we lose people when we don't wait the beat, take the breath and like acknowledge all of the stuff that comes up in this and that like, and also that we're capable of holding it all at the same time. Yeah. Uh, Another narrative I hate, um, is that, uh, this is all your fault. Um, the individual action frame, um, which individual actions are great. I take them all the time. Um, bottle of water bottle here today, right there. Um, but there's systemic change that needs to happen. Also, you can participate in collective action before you've participated in individual action. They don't. One doesn't have to necessarily precede the other. They're both valid pathways. Um, and I think that the individual narrative or the individual action narrative, like, well, your po- your personal plastic water bottle did this, um, is really, um, it, it freezes people up and they don't want to engage because they feel like they're the problem. This isn't quite the same, but um, it's, and it, it's emblematic, I think, of a narrative that I find really problematic, which is electric cars. I don't have an issue with electric cars, but... Um, we focus really narrowly on like the fuel source of our vehicle and we don't focus at all on like the emissions of the vehicle itself. And also like what owning a car does to where we live and our patterns of habitation and that like there are massive GHG em- um, emissions associated with road working. And so like the um, Detroit as a city was shrinking even as Detroit as a metro area was growing. And so there was a ton of road happening in Detroit and it was people moving out to the suburbs and the exurbs. And that is a carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. Um, But beyond that, also the further away you live from where you work, the more it fragments your relationships, right? And so like patterns of transportation aren't just fungible. Like there are problems with cars that are more than their tailpipe emissions. And we haven't we keep wanting to do this one-to-one substitution where like, okay, so your gas stove is a problem, get an electric one. Your gas car is a problem, get an electric one. And we're not doing the thing, which I guess is a little bit close to what Catherine was saying, which is like taking a beat and taking a step back and asking the fundamental question of like, what is the service we're actually want? What is, what is this supposed to do? And this is a really dumb example, but when I was in my twenties, I read this I was really into frugality and I read this book about like this guy was like kind of off the chain. He was a little bit, you shouldn't be this frugal, but anyway, (laughs) one of his, um, he was, he didn't have a, he had a washing machine, but he didn't have a dryer and he had a family and they were reaching this point where like the clothes weren't, I didn't know this was a thing, but the clothes were not freeze drying fast enough. And so they were running out of clothes. And so they were like very much like, Oh, we need to buy 
a dryer because our clothes are not drying fast enough in winter. And then they finally realized that the issue was they didn't have enough clothes and that buying a few extra articles of clothing was actually cheaper. Like going to Goodwill and buying a bunch of secondhand stuff was actually cheaper and more um, like better over the long term than buying a dryer and needing the hookup and like the extra energy costs. But we get very, because I think we get handed these solutions, we get very fixated on this is the problem. This is the solution that we don't actually fully articulate the problem. Like his problem is in his case wasn't that he needed was not that the clothes weren't drying fast enough. The problem was that he didn't have enough clothes. Yeah. yeah. Kate, what's your uh, least favorite zombie narrative? Oh, I I hate so much. Um, <laughs> I think one of my least favorite narratives is this notion that oh it'll all be fine because we'll adapt. Um, climate change will get really bad and we will use the best available science to make rational decisions about what we do. Um, but wouldn't we have done that? Uh, totally. Yeah. Um, and that is a great segue to my next question. So my next question is about who is doing storytelling well from a fictional perspective. And my favorite work of climate change fiction is Mad Max Fury Road, um, mm. because it really challenges that, oh, climate change happens, and we make sensible decisions, and we conserve gasoline and we don't drive around and set fire to things for no reason in the desert. No, that's exactly what we do. Um, so I, I really want to know um, from the perspective of, of fiction, whether that's film or novels, like who's doing this well? I'm going first because I have already dropped my favorite thing ever, which is The Expanse. How many of you guys watch The Expanse? Okay, so you need to get on it. Um, the New York Public Library actually has it on DVD if you have a DVD player. Is it on Netflix? Uh, it's on Amazon Prime. Um, so Bezos. Find a friend and steal their Prime account. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to confirm or deny that's how I do it. Um, <laughs> it's also a book series, so you can buy the books. There are eight of them plus like 12 novellas. Um, I'm deep. Anyway, <laughs> the point I'm making is that um, I told Kate this earlier, but like oftentimes when you talk about books that are set in the future, and I believe the books are set about 300 years in the future, please don't correct me, um, the future is either like a utopia that's about to become dystopic or it's a dystopia that ends hopefully like cheerfully utopic. Is that a word? I don't think that's a word. Um, and I don't know how it ends because there are nine books and only eight of them are published. Um, so if you guys are watching get on it. Um, <laughs> but the thing that I really appreciate about the book series is it sort of treats the future as a place in which climate change has happened. And it's neither a utopia or a dystopia. It's like we have gotten our ish together enough that we continue to exist as a species in mass, but we haven't solved all of our problems and going into outer space hasn't solved them either. Um, you can watch the trailer, the intro on YouTube, and the, in the intro, like, New York City has a massive seawall, the Statue of Liberty has a seawall, Amsterdam has a seawall, like, they really do this really beautiful job visually of chronicling what um, climate change means as a planet. Um, the polar ice caps melt, all of that happens, but we still manage to survive. I'm not saying it's a good future, I'm just saying that it's a future in which it is not Mad Max Fury Road. Um, it's a little bit more hopeful than that, even if it's not the, like idyllic future I think we all aspire towards yeah um well I will go with someone who's uh no longer <laughs> living unfortunately but Octavia Butler in Parable the Sower and Parable the Talents that's true I think did uh, on oh it's okay <laughs> um I think those two novels did a really beautiful job of um really like clairvoyant job because she wrote them in I believe the 90s um and they read like newsreels today like they give me goosebumps um, so I'll start there. Um, another good example, I think, is a show on Netflix that was called, or not Netflix, HBO, called Years and Years, um, where they like sort of, yeah, they like fast forward every like five years or so and show you what happens and set in Britain. So it's like, this is what happened after we Brexited. This is what happened when we got like really draconian about immigration. And at the same time, climate change is also happening and there's power shutoffs and um, shows like how it creeps up on you. Um, so I think that was a really great job. What, but a trend that I'm noticing in a lot of our fiction and entertainment is this uh, tendency to create a whole different worlds. Um, I'm thinking of things like BoJack Horseman, 
um, which I love, and Tuca and Birdie, and like these cartoons that show, or Rick and Morty is another good example, where it's just like, I. it almost seems like people are like, I don't want to deal with this world anymore. I want to create something totally different, where climate change doesn't exist, never existed, and like there's a robin hanging out with a snake. Cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I feel like that's just like a sort of dissociation, which while I love those shows, watch those shows, escape into those shows, I worry about that tendency. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't think there's a lot, to be honest. Um, so it's been, it, it's been 21 years since I read Ishmael by Daniel Quinn. But that, I, can, I think I can say definitively that that's the only novel that really transformed my thinking about what it means to be a human being on this planet, um, particularly because of the work that it does to unmask the, the stories that we tell, the myths that we tell um, about who we are and why we're here and what we can and can't do. Um, and actually, <clears throat> I think in... So I, I lived in the woods for four months when I was a sophomore in high school, read that book, um, started reading Mary Oliver's poetry. I, I would say, actually, I think poetry for me has had much more power um, mm -hmm. than than f f fiction of any kind. Um, I think because it creates it creates heart space mm -hmm. um, for this thing that I think is fundamentally a question of um, of the human heart um, and and what we what we value, what we care about, what we believe, whether we show up with love or not. Um, and that's certainly where I go for nourishment and, and sort of sense making um, in, yeah, in these moments. Yeah, I would be, oh, sorry, go ahead, Kendra. No. I was just going to ask if I should mention the Marvel thing. The what? The Marvel thing. Go for it. <laughs> so <laughs> how many of you guys? Not Kate Marvel. No. Yeah. <laughs> no relationship. How many, you guys have watched like, the Avengers. So how many of you guys have watched Ghostbusters? The original, not the remake. Nothing against remake, but this only applies to the original. Both. So <laughs> both one of the things that you notice with the who's the villain in like who's the low key villain in Ghostbusters? The EPA, right? It's the EPA that shuts down the containment unit. Who's the low key villain or the like thematic villain through all of the Avenger through all of the Marvel, the twenty six or whatever Marvel's movies, it's Thanos and he has an environmental message. Um, which is he's doing this, he's committing genocide to save planets from overpopulation um and resource constraints. And so one of the things that I've noticed is that oftentimes when it's an environmental movie, it's like over you know, it's like the day after tomorrow, it's like very over the top and like this strong environmental movement. But oftentimes when it's just like a movie, the undercurrent is like the environmentalists are like the bad guy. And I don't have like a thesis about this beyond like it's just a thing that I've noticed. Um uh and like, what does that say about us as a culture where it's so easy to reach for an environmental argument to be the motivation for like a villain? Yeah. I, I've never seen the Marvel movies, but to what? that. Sorry. I've seen you. Um, <laughs> but, I thought you were them. No? Yeah, exactly. Um, but Wait, not even Black Panther? Oh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I love that one. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, we're going to have to revoke some cards. Uh, that's Marvel? That's yeah. cool. Um, I thought it was just Lupita. Um, but interesting to hear you explain what Thanos is or who he is or whatever that is. Um, he's not so much an environmentalist the way you're describing. He's an eco-fascist. And I'm fine with them being the bad guys. Right, but I guess my point is that he still has an environmental message. No, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. That's arguing. a very good point. Yeah. That like the the environmental person is an eco-fascist and is the bad guy. That's interesting. Um, I also would be remiss in this to answer this question, not to mention Amitav Ghosh, who I think has done really important work on the inclusion of fic of uh, environmental messages in our fiction, both from the nonfiction and the fiction side. Um, his recent book, um, which my mind is blanking on, I thought I would have. Gun Island, yes, fiction uh, fiction was Gun Island and nonfiction was The Great Derangement. Thought I would have thought of it by the time I finished that sentence, but I didn't. Um, and also uh, Arundhati Roy's The Ministry of Utmost Happiness, plus all of her essays. So I think there's a lot of great fiction in this realm um, coming from the global south, which is really encouraging. 
there's one other that I want to point out for younger readers, which is the story of Owen. Um, it's a Canadian book, and it has dragons, and the dragons feed on carbon emissions. So rather than curb our carbon emissions, we just hire dragon slayers. <laughs> Word. <laughs> Into it. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so I want to I wanna wrap up this portion so we have enough time for audience members to ask questions. But I feel like the question that is obligatory at the end of every climate panel is one that I will not ask. Um, okay. But the obligatory question is, what gives you hope? And that is really problematic to me because I don't see it as my job to give anybody hope. Yeah. But I think, as Catherine mentioned, there is a whole spectrum of emotions that people can feel when it comes to climate change. You can feel grief, you can feel love, you can feel determination, you can feel anger. And so instead of asking, what gives you hope? I want to end by asking, what makes you feel one of those emotions or more? What makes you feel the most? Okay, well, I wrote a whole essay on how my main emotion around climate is love. And the reason I chose that emotion is because I think it is expansive enough to include all of those emotions on all of my days that I feel about climate change, which is all of them. Um, sometimes I feel rage. Sometimes I feel vengeance. Um, that's pretty frequent. And um, <laughs> other times I feel just like intense, intense sadness. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's kind of where I'm at with it. Were you asking like what gives me those emotions? Um, the fact that I wanna live. I would say the thing that I feel the most, um, they're kind of intertwined, is both a sense of obligation and also a sense of being haunted. Um, five years ago, four years ago, I was in Myanmar reporting on climate migration, specifically um, people who had moved into Yangon out of being hit by after being hit by Cyclone Nargis, so they'd moved out of the Delta, and they were living in an informal settlement that the government could move them off of at any time, and they were willing to talk to me because they felt that they needed the attention so that the government wouldn't kick them off of their land. And I interviewed this man, and he had survived Nargis by holding onto a tree, but he'd lost, he'd had 11, it, there were 12 of them, there were 12 family members in total, and he'd lost everyone but him and his son. Mm -hmm. um, and then after the cyclone came out, um, he couldn't farm anymore because um, what we don't often talk about with um, hurricanes is that hurricanes come from the ocean and it's salt water, and so his land was salinated, and so he had no choice, but he had to leave. And I just couldn't imagine losing everyone that you've ever loved and also being forced out of your home. And then, um, depending on some foreign reporter, barely, I don't think I'd even graduated J school. I think I was technically graduating a month later to tell your story in a forum that would hopefully get your government to ask in, act in some way. I also spoke to this really elderly woman who told me the story about how every time it rained and it's Myanmar and so they have a monsoon season, after Nargis, she would she wouldn't sleep. She couldn't sleep when it rained. And it was only when she moved to this informal settlement that she could sleep again. And I just feel a tremendous amount of obligation to these people have voices. I don't feel like I'm giving voice to the voiceless, but I do feel like I'm shining. I have, when I do my job right, I have the ability to put a magnifying glass or I don't know, a microphone on their voices, I guess. Um, and every time I'm not doing that, I feel like bad. I don't know how to explain it. I, yeah. Um, I have a few thoughts about this. So I think I feel, I think most of all, I feel connected. Um, and, you know, I think the the feeling that kind of takes over me most often is a feeling of of heartbreak um, and a, f a few years ago, I went on a retreat with a bunch of quote unquote young leaders and activists with Parker Palmer, who's a longtime Quaker thought leader, author, teacher. Um, and Parker talks about, he talks about this concept called the tragic gap, um, that we, that part of the work is the like the work before the work and the work to stay in the work. So to like look headlong at the reality of what is and be able to hold a vision of what is possible. 
and that it is really easy to flip out into starry-eyed optimism, Pollyanna bullshit. It's easy to flip out into cynicism and and just kind of um, hardness and and that it is you have to be so intentional every day to be willing to show up for the tragic gap. Um, and so I think a lot about like you can either just have a broken heart um, or your heart can be broken open. And, and it's like that for me, that really subtle shift um, from just like incapacitating, like curl up on my couch sadness and, um, and the kind of sadness that actually generates active empathy and determination. And as you've written about so beautifully, Kate, courage. Um, and, and so like, I think it's just, it's a, it's a cycle. Um, and I know that I'm not doing enough of the inner work when I'm just in the like grief side of the heartbreak and not in the courage side of, of the heartbreak. And so that is often about, tapping back into the connection piece. So getting like into circle, into community, um, like touching moss, <laughs> um, you know, being like being in nature and, and reminding myself that like at the end of the day, no matter what I'm feeling, um, like what I want to do day to day is to continue to show up to be part of the healing that, that I think we're, um, hopefully collectively manifesting. Thank you. Um, so we have a little bit of time left. I'd like to open it up to the audience. We have people with microphones um, who will bring you a microphone. Um, please try to ask more of a question than a comment. Um, and we'll take questions, I think, in groups of three. So um, right there, you first, I think, in the black shirt. coming. So disinformation campaigns were mentioned, um, and I'm wondering what we can do about false narratives about climate change that propagate on social media and end up overshadowing like, legitimate news about climate change. Great. And was there, was, were there more questions uh, right there? <laughs> I, so my question is, um, so I'm getting a lot of, you know, stories to kind of make people digest climate change. And then with those stories, how do you funnel those into, uh, maybe this is my mechanical reaction to problem solution, but um, like, how do you funnel those stories into something or, or, or is the story itself enough to then make people feel, I, I, I Great. And was there one in this, uh, back there in the brown? Um, and then on the point of um, narratives and kind of, I don't know, I, I've been hearing a lot about tipping points and uh, wondering how to make sense of those and how to make those, um, I don't know, not be something that we're oversaturated in, but also something that we're like scared about, but hopeful that we can, I don't know, like it's scary, but how does that happen? Like how do, how do we talk about tipping points? Wait, can I clarify? Do you mean social tipping points or scientific tipping points? Uh, scientific. Okay. Although we could also talk about. Interesting. Okay. So um, the three questions were, how do we deal with this information? How do we funnel stories into something? And uh, what's up with tipping points? On the disinformation thing, the most important thing I think we can do is not amplify it. Um, and so as a journalist, like one of the first questions I ask is, is this, a, is this a thing that is necessary of addressing? And obviously it depends on where it's coming from. But um, oftentimes I think there's this knee jerk reaction where you want to like quote tweet someone and call someone out if you really feel the need to to respond to someone because it's so problematic. It's better to do it as a response to the tweet and don't like you know, don't quote tweet it and amplify it so lots more people can see it. And sometimes you just have to give space for people to have stupid opinions. Um, but you're right, there is also a coordinated disinformation attempt. And sometimes the way that um, 
it's been less of a thing in my current position, but in my last job, I would either sometimes write articles that sort of address the thesis head on, but other times I would write the articles that were equivalent to like a subtweet. So like, I don't actually deal with what the article, like what the piece of misinformation actually is. I don't ever mention that people are saying, I don't know that cheese, the moon is made of cheese, but I do an entire article about like how the moon is made of, I don't know, milk. butter. But uh, why would you do that to me? I don't like butter. Um, yeah, I hate it too. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, so there are ways of like addressing things without necessarily addressing them. Because one of the big concerns is that if I tell you that, um, you know, I mean, this comes up a lot, but if I tell you that vaccines don't cause autism, many people will walk away with the belief that vaccines cause autism. So it's a real kind of struggle and tension to figure out how you address those claims. Yeah. I, I think the best way to deal with uh, disinformation is to tell the truth um, and to tell it well. Um, I also, though, like, I mean, I'm not, you know, an official reporter at the New York Times, so I do troll fossil fuel companies on on the Twitter machine. It's great. Feels good to me. Um, recommend it uh, if you can get away with it. Um, I think there's something important to, like, exposing the emperor as naked as hell. Um, and also, fuck them. What was the other question? It, it was um, one of my favorite to- things ever on Twitter when I saw Mary... Uh, Right on a BP tweet about like bitch police. No, it was yeah. it was it was because it was about find out your carbon footprint. And Mary was like, "What's yours, bitch?" <laughs> <laughs> they never responded to me. They responded like that. Other people never responded to me. Still waiting. I want to get blocked by one. That's one of my goals. So of speaking of, is that yeah. an example of funneling a story into an action? <laughs> was for me. Reported them. <laughs> I felt bad. <laughs> I felt better. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I feel like it actually shows a lot of people that these places can be like attacked, that they are not infallible. And it also, I think one of the biggest problems in the climate conversation is that the villain hasn't been thoroughly named uh, yet. I think we're starting to get there. I'm seeing more and more people like call out fossil fuel companies for, for the pyromaniacs that they are. Um, and m- the more that we do that, the more we need to. And I also think that some of this disinformation has become so ingrained that we do have to call it out. And I know that's not at all what Kendra was arguing against. Um, so, yeah, maybe. Mm. So I always try to remember, um, I really don't like it when people tell me what to think. And I really don't like it when people tell me what to do. Or feel. Or feel. Um, I really like it when a, a piece of story or narrative or communication makes an invitation, mm-hmm. right? Or creates an experience that lets me sort of step into, you know, possibly thinking something, entertaining a feeling, um, considering what it might mean to take one action or another. Um, because I think, you know, and, and I think this is part of what failed for so long in climate communication is like trying to tell people to change their minds. And it's like, when was the last time somebody told you to change your mind and you did, right? You change your own mind. You change your own um, ways of showing up in your in your life. And, and so I think like there's a sort of, there's like a dangerous thing that I think sometimes the more a story is oriented towards telling you what to do, the less convincing it is to actually do something that you're not currently doing today. Yeah. As for the tipping point question, I think the way I think about them, I can't tell anyone else how to think about them is that I'm going to do my damnedest to contribute to us not tipping over. Um, Cause yes, they are scary, but I just feel like, it's the least I can do and also the most I can do. All right, um, more questions? Oh, a lot. Um, okay, how about we go over to this part of the room? Um, so green jacket and then um, black uh, tank top and whoever is nearest them, uh, right there. So, so according to Pew, 90% of Americans believe in God. 56% believe in the God of the Bible, the other third in the higher spiritual power and and so having been doing kind of climate communications for a while I realized there's kind of this like missing gap like do you guys see anyone doing really good spiritual or god-centric communications around the climate crisis that is 
I mean, yes, there's there's a sense of awe and there's creation care, but have you seen anything just like fundamentally really, really good? Because it feels like that's a place we don't normally go, those of us who come from a more science-based background, but it seems like that's where everybody else is. And then right there. Hi, um, I really like the emphasis on storytelling, especially in written work that we're doing and how you were talking about moving people from this shock and this grief to solutions too quickly and not giving them that space. And I know that storytelling is such an effective way to counter that. I mean, Mary, like a year ago, one of your articles got me through my own like climate grief. So it's Aww. really, yeah, it's really special. Class got canceled, so I got to come here today. I was so excited. <laughs> um, but um, kind Thank of, you. yeah, you're so welcome. I'm um, kind of extending that. I was wondering if any of you have any advice on how to approach that similar transition and dealing with people's grief in a more interpersonal context and in real time, maybe with people you really love, like your parents who you know, you don't want to bring them to that terrible place, but you have to. And if you have any experience dealing with that. So I was wondering in the framework of climate communication, can we make numbers effective to portraying a message? Because to contextualize this, I'm thinking of um, one of the last speeches that Greta Thunberg gave at Davos was really stressing carbon, carbon budgets. And it was a lot of numbers, really data heavy. And although I love the work that Greta has done and the movement that has been inspired by her, I was just wondering, just off of that thought, is there a way to actually use numbers in a really effective and engaging way? And what do you think those ways are? Great. So we've got God, grief, and numbers. I have thoughts on all of these things. <laughs> I would um, like to hear them. Okay, so I'll go in backwards order. So to use numbers, I think the number of billion animals dying in Australia, super affecting and powerful. I think um, also 1.5 degrees or like, it's, prob it's a problematic narrative, but the 12 years to have high emissions uh, is an effective narrative. It, I think numbers work when they're simple. Now, if I'm giving you like 57.089789910, like pi uh, <laughs> percent of whatever, like that's, that's gonna lose people. Their eyes are gonna glaze over pretty quickly. But if they're round numbers, if they're effective numbers, um, you can definitely tell a story with them. Um, the story going back around to like how to deal with other people's climate grief, I'm not an expert, but the way that I've done it is to show them my own. Um, and then hopefully they can see themselves in it and to basically validate their emotions um, unless their emotions are like, that's not real because that's not an emotion, that's just denial. And even to some extent, I understand why people go through denial and they kind of need to be coached through it unless they're like the Republican Party when they're just like bad faith actors. Um, the other question about God, I've seen a lot of great communications that that center God and God-centric um, storytelling. Um, one I'll name is No Place Like Home podcast, uh, which is done by my friend Anna Jane Joyner and Marianne Hitt, um, and I think they do a really good job. Um, others are Catherine Hayhoe, uh, centers God in a lot of her climate storytelling, and I'm sure there's others, but I'll let my other panelists talk. Um, so I'm very fortunate to work with a dedicated graphics designer. Nadia Popovich, and so we do a lot of numbers stuff, and we do a lot of data visualizations. And she did um, she did one that like really blew a lot of people's minds called "How Hot Is Your Hometown," and it looked at the year that you were born, and then like what projected it how hot it would be of the future, so you could see that change. Um, she is amazing. So like, yeah, you can totally bring numbers to life. I can see anecdotally the thing. It's also not just about the number; it's about also. And I don't mean like not just how you visually present it, but like a thing that I often like to tell people um, when I do talks is I'm like, how old are you? And then I'll say something like, you know, if you're born after 1976, you've never experienced a normal temperature year. That's the same as the climate stripes, you know? But like it really, it hits people in a place that like, it's like, what is normal? I, I, told, I should not have done this, but I told this to a bunch of 11 year olds. And one girl <laughs> looked at me. <laughs> Damn, Kendra. <laughs> And, she, and I, I broke them. I, I, this is why like, I've since reassessed how um, I tell people this. But this one girl was like, it's like my parents have lied to me my entire lives. And I was like, that is not the takeaway. That is not the takeaway. <laughs> um, 
Um, I have no good tips for dealing with climate grief at all. Like, do not come to me for them. I'm a journalist. We don't acknowledge emotions. Um, <laughs> but I will say, on the religion thing, um, you know, there's the Pope. So one of the issue with, like, the God situation is that <laughs> there is um, there are many religions and there are many... I'm just using Christianity because it's the denom it's the religion that I'm most familiar with because I went to 13 years of Catholic school, which brings us back to why I'm not a good person to deal with grief. Um, <laughs> what about guilt? Oh, I'm so good with guilt. Yeah, like I'm, yeah. I'm generally my default is I did it, um, uh -huh, and you uh -huh. just have to tell me what I did, and I will admit to it. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I will exploit that. <laughs> I'm very guilty all of the time. Um, uh, so like, uh, it's really funny because I get a wide variety of mail from, uh, religious or, or Christian groups. And some of it is telling me to give up this climate change thing and find Jesus. And I haven't done this and I desperately want to do this, but I would definitely, it's not a good thing to do, but I, I often want to say, you know, write back and say, well, the Pope believes in climate change. And so I think I'm on God's side. Um, but, um, you know, so the Pope, the Catholic Church, the Pope, the encyclical, they have a whole thing on climate change. Judaism has a lot that they're doing around climate change. And so it's really denomination to denomination. And I think that's partly what makes it really tricky. Is, you know, I wrote a story about Reverend Barber, who considers himself an evangelical. Um, and he thinks that the rest of the evangelical movement, uh, you know, is on the is backing the wrong horse in terms of climate change. Um, so there's even a schism within evangelicals. And so it's tricky because you... It required, so I think part of it, why a lot of people have, or it's not covered as much, is part of it is you're dealing with a lot of religious nuance that I, as a climate reporter, don't have. Like, I know a lot about Catholicism because of the aforementioned 13 years of Catholicism. So you're dealing with a lot of religious nuance, and then you're dealing with a lot of climate nuance, and I can see how that makes a lot of people... There are a lot of minefields that you're trying to traverse, so I think people have to do it really careful and thoughtfully, and it just hasn't been done as much. Catherine, can you be quick so we can squeeze in some more questions? I'm going to be quick, um, except, Kate, as you know, my first book was called Between God and Green, How Evangelicals Are Cultivating a Middle Ground on Climate Change, so I spent a lot of time researching and thinking about this question. Um, I would say, like, don't, A, don't write off the creation care narrative. Much of the reason why it has uh, had limited success is because the climate denial machine went after it. So the same Coke money, Exxon money that has fueled climate denialism also went after the kind of more moderate evangelical leadership on climate. Um, it is not uh, dead, certainly among younger evangelicals who are continuing to, to push. And I think that's actually part of where we're seeing some interesting generational shift uh, among more conservative folks. Um, between God and Green, you can read all of that if you are interested. Um, I also think that part of the piece around religion is that, and part of the power is having a space for storytelling and unpacking narrative and discourse together. So spaces for conversation, I think are more powerful than one way conversations. Um, I personally think some of the most compelling spiritual narratives around climate at the moment are those that are um, talking about indigenous prophecy uh, and sort of living and working in a time of prophecy. And Sherry Mitchell in particular wrote a fantastic book that came out in 2018 called Sacred Instructions. And the last chapter of that is incredibly um, powerful on that topic. Um, uh, the lesson that we have learned from Drawdown is that people are obsessed with rankings. So, not, I mean, hello, BuzzFeed. Uh, but, like, really <laughs> they're obsessed with rankings to a degree that's problematic, so you have to be careful about them. Um, but that can be a, an interesting way to use numbers. And I think on the feeling side, um, I think the biggest thing is, sh is actually being willing to show them. Mm -hmm. um, so when I was getting ready to give my TED Talk, they were like, take out all the emotion maybe a little bit at the end. And I was like, absolutely not. Like, I, that's not how I communicate this it, around this topic. It's dishonest. It's dishonest. It's also like, we've tried it for 30 years and it really hasn't worked. Um, so, so I think like being willing to show up in a space that has been very like head dominated with your heart also accessible um, is incredibly powerful. 
Wonderful. Um, I want to squeeze in some more questions. Um, so let's let's try in the back. Um, so right there and right there. Actually, you with the microphone, why don't you ask the first question? Because you had one, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm an educational designer and technologist. And I've been working on sort of this big, broad question for a long time of just how do you teach people about living sustainably and creating resilient built environments, right? It's, it's, it's a lot. What, from your perspectives, do you think are really the like, most basic and foundational concepts that people need to understand and understand well to be able to participate in the conversations that, and then contribute to solutions. And alongside that, um, I wonder also what you think about whether or not somebody actually needs to share the ethos of all of this to be able to contribute to solutions. Hi, uh, thank you all for being here and for, from what you've said so far. I'm just thinking about like the title of this being the new climate story and the kind of narratives we're telling about climate change. And I think we've heard a lot about the kind of fear and like negative implications of living in a world with climate change. And I'm wondering if there's any sort of positive story we can be telling that encourages people or motivates people. Like, is there you know, if we're acting on any of these solutions, is there a positive world that we can see? You know, like it's all talking about if we don't do anything, it's going to be disastrous. What if we do do something? You know, can this be a better place, not a worse one? Back to fear. Sorry. Um, <laughs> That's uh, the name of an album, ain't it? <laughs> uh, I've noticed, I'm sure you've noticed too, in the last, uh, probably just the last year, there's been this huge increase in use of crisis or emergency language uh, associated with climate change. I'm curious uh, how you think of that as an opportunity or uh, a risk um, if we're looking at mitigation or adaptation. Great. So we've got um, what are the basic concepts people need to understand? So sustainability 101, um, can we tell positive stories and what's up with crisis? I'm gonna sort of uh, merge a little bit around the first two questions. Um, so I, again, this is sort of like what I've seen in action around drawdown um, is that I think starting with solutions can actually create openings where there are not otherwise openings. Um, uh, I have a friend who sent Drawdown to his like Trump loving nephew and he's obsessed with it. Like he's like, these are all definitely things we should do, right? There may be disagreements about how those should be pursued, um, who decides, who benefits, right? A lot of those sorts of equity and justice questions, particularly around like what solutions move forward and how and where, like maybe disagreement there, but I think actually there is, um, there starts to be common ground around solutions, not just because they're solutions to the climate crisis. So I live in Atlanta. We had a breakthrough in Georgia around um, solar policy because the Sierra Club and the quote unquote Green Tea Party came together for very different motivations. Um, you can imagine what the Sierra Club was after. Um, but the Green Tea Party was like, you have never known freedom, like making your own electricity, um, <laughs> right? And then like there was a dude on the Public Service Commission named Bubba McDonald who did not give a hoot about climate change, did not give a hoot about making his own electricity, but he did realize he could write himself into the history books of the PSC if he was like the deciding vote on solar. So. All that to say, like, I think um, there are sort of interesting, strange bedfellow opportunities around solutions. And I think also solutions are where we can talk about solving or addressing near-term needs at the same time that we're working towards long-term goals or things that we sort of see and feel and benefit from more immediately and more locally as we're after this sort of big, diffuse um, global challenge. And I think Beth Sawin's work on multi-solving is really fantastic at, at Climate Interactive. Um, and she's a great person also to follow on Twitter um, for those sorts of uh, conversations. Yeah. Um, agreed. I think that um, what you need to understand is who the bad guys are, what they did, what the consequences are, and now let's go get them. 
those are like that's basically what I understand. I can't tell you shit about carbon dioxide, really. Um, that's not true. I can't, but I don't want to. Um, and the other uh, question was, um, what was the second question? Uh, when can we tell positive stories? Can we tell positive stories? Yeah, and that that to me is why it's really important to include justice as part of why we're doing this because to me. Um, I am involved in climate because I see racism and sexism and all of the other forms of bigotry as core to it. And therefore, in order to solve it, we need to solve those other problems too. And that, to me, creates a really beautiful world. That creates a world where there are climate reparations. Um, that creates a world where there are ecocide tribunals. And I get a front row seat. And it's glory. I'm sorry, what was the last question? Um, <laughs> climate emergency. Crisis, emergency. Yeah, what about it? Um, bad, good, bad, helpful, useful? I, so far, I've seen it used in a really mobilizing way, and I think mobilization is good. Um, so the Times doesn't use it. Uh, climate emergency or climate crisis. Like, if somebody says it, and we're quoting them, we'll use it, but um, we use climate change or, to a lesser extent, global warming. Um, and I've thought about this a lot, and one of the things that I think about is there was a push a few years ago to, I think, in the UK to stop using the phrase, um, like, car accident, because most, um, because it implies this element of like inevitability, and most accidents are actually the product of decisions that people are making, whether it's to drive or text or to drink and drive or whatever. Like there, generally there are very few, sort of like accidents. And I think a lot about like the war on cancer and how we still have cancer, even though we've had a war in it for thirty years. And I think either way, people can often get very tied up on like the exact phrasing of a thing and not what the story conveys. And in some ways, I think um, when I'm writing about something that is especially horrific, um, it is easier or better to just make plain what I'm doing than to declare that it's a crisis or an emergency um, because you should know that. Like if, if I haven't done it, if I haven't described it in a good enough term that, that you don't realize that it's a problem, then I I've failed as a reporter. Um, and so in some ways for me, not being able to use that phrasing is actually, um, it's like a haiku or something. It's like actually really liberating in a sp specific way because it is constraining me in ways that make me, that force me to be a lot more descriptive. Um, we're running out of time, but I, I want to end by acknowledging that last question or penultimate question about can we have a positive vision? And from a scientific perspective, we know that everything is going to change. It's either going to change because we're not going to take any action and the temperature is going to rise and we're going to live on a fundamentally different planet, or everything's going to change because we are going to change everything in order to stop that. And I think in that space, there's room for all manner of dreams. There's, there's room for the most horrible nightmares, but there's also room for anything that you might want to dream. And so I just want to say thank you for coming here. Thank you for your questions. Um, thank you for thinking about how you dream those dreams. Um, and thank you so much to the panel. Um, thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your humor. Thank you for being here. Thank, Thank you. you.